Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about what does it take to become a great manager. And in my own experience, I've had the opportunity to work with some folks who I thought were great managers and some who were not so great. And so in this discussion today, we have Kat lavers Malay, a former GM and studio head at King. And I'll actually give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about your background, as well as James Nichols, current GM at Zynga of Natural Motion. And both of you actually were identified to me as really great managers. So I am dying to ask you both a lot of questions about what does it take to be a great manager and how, why do people consider the two of you great managers? But just to kind of set the stage and to let people know a little bit more about you, uh, maybe we could have you start by giving a quick introduction in terms of your experience and background, starting with you, Kat. Uh, sure. So I've spent my career building, call it product-centric businesses. So I've spent a long time in the games trenches um, as a product manager at Playfish uh, and then coming up through EA uh, as a producer, executive producer, and then went over to King, um, where I built out the UK studios as their first head of studios there. Um, since then, went at Bose, uh, an AI startup, a couple other things. And then I have uh, now set up my own consulting business helping uh, growing companies with their operating strategy, uh, figuring out you know, how to get from here to there. And spoiler alert, it's all about people, right? Like it's all about <laughs> figuring out right. how to manage people through complex, messy stuff. Great, and James? Hi, uh, yeah, so I, I'm James. I'm the general manager of a new studio for Natural Motion in the Midlands in Birmingham. Um, I've been with this studio for a year, uh, gradually building it up from, from nothing, um, which is super fun. Before that, I was at King for four years. In fact, Kat, Kat interviewed me just before I joined, which was super awesome. So we haven't met once or twice before. Um, I was there for four years doing kind of design direction and then um, production direction. The last year I was there and, and running teams. Before that, I was at Codemasters for seven years and various other companies before that. So I've, I've worked in games industry all my career for about 19 years or so, uh, mostly console and PC and, and AAA, and then more, more recently uh, free-to-play type games. Um, so, yeah, I've been kind of managing people from a reasonably early age. I think I was in my kind of early 20s when I got a team sort of <laughs> thrust upon me and had to make it work from there. So I kind of learned on the job and uh, kind of made it work from there, really. Okay. And so maybe just to dive right in and get getting straight to the point, maybe we should just open with the first question in terms of what does it actually mean to be a great manager? So in other words, if you were to like break down the responsibilities or like the objectives of a manager, how would you break that down in terms of like the different responsibilities? And maybe you could also speak to what are the hardest parts or the, the hardest things to do as a great manager? And since you're first in my window, maybe starting with you, James? Uh, sure, I mean, obviously there's, there's loads to it and it's very contextual as well. I think as a general thing, a manager is somebody that enables people to become better at what they do, uh, levels them up within the, the framework that they're in at the moment. So you're looking for someone really who's at least fairly humble or, or gets some motivation from that, that side of work. Um, if there's somebody that needs to you know, impress upon everyone else that they're the, the leader and the person in charge, it normally doesn't last very well. So if, if you're that kind of person that loves seeing people kind of come through and develop and you know, nurture underneath you, then it's uh, normally a good sign that you've got the right kind of basic qualities. And then you can go into like lots and lots of details about how they organize and run things. But I think you need somebody who's kind of firm but fair in their approach. It's no good being everybody's bestest buddy all the time because that can sometimes be tough to keep going when you hit hard times. So you need someone with that kind of mentality that's going to, you know, keep keep things in bounds, but also, um, you know, sort of step in when, when need be. Um, you need someone who's an awesome communicator, I think. And when I say, you know, great communication, that's not standing up in front of a group of people and, you know, giving a great oratory <laughs> performance. It's more about somebody who can adapt their communication to lots of different people. So in a group setting, in one-to-ones, you know, getting through tough conversations with people, uh, sort of recalibrating your calibration based off the individual. So I think all of those things are kind of in the mixture for pretty much any manager. I think you've got to be fairly authentic in the way you come across. 
if you're, you know, people are not going to really buy into how you're leading them if you are coming across as somebody that's, you know, fake or, you know, saying things they don't believe in, I think that's going to undermine you pretty quickly. So I think that's kind of a really broad kind of starting point. I'm sure you'd like to come in, Kat, though, as well. There's probably loads of things I haven't thought of there. Yeah, James, I, I think that's a really good list. I think, I, I th- you know, there's a lot of conversation around what is leadership and, and what is management, and you can get super academic on kind of parsing those things out, right? But at the end of the day, you've got two parts, right? You've got to lead the business and you've got to develop the people and you do, you know, one without the other, well, it's going to collapse, right? And, and so if you think about the business part, um, I would say it's about ensuring that important decisions get made, but but more importantly, James, I think, as you pointed out, being able to tell a story, right? Talk about like, where are you going? Why does it matter, right? Like what's the journey and why is the work worth it? Uh, and on the people side, I think obviously there's all the mechanics around goal setting and making sure that people are doing the right work and that they know what good looks like and that they have, um, they understand kind of the path that they're on. But where, uh, what I think separates the good managers from the great managers, and by the way, I'm super flattered to be um, at least someone lumps me among the great managers because um, I, I think it's like, by far the, the most important part of uh, of what I do is being able to link those things together and understand, doesn't matter how big your team is, right? Understand each person on an individual level and make it clear to them how what they're doing in their day-to-day, how that ties back to the bigger story. Like, why does it matter right because not every day is going to be a fun day um so if i'm getting up in the midst of a pandemic and it's kind of a slog what what's it all for and and i think to me the uh the hardest part about being a manager is when those two sides of the coin collide right the lead the business and develop the people particularly in games right like people work in games because it's a passion right? It's a creative business. You've got people putting really their sort of heart and soul into making a thing. And sometimes through no fault of their own, it just doesn't work, right? Like they've done all the right things. We asked them to do a thing. They did the thing. Players didn't like it, right? Or someone else's product was better or it was too expensive to buy an ad, right? And so now you've you've got to um, make those hard business decisions while also being empathetic and understanding people on an individual level. Um, Mm -hmm. And to me, that's really hard. And it's also what separates the good leaders and managers uh, from from the great ones, right? If you can't make those hard decisions, if you just kind of delay or postpone because it's hard, you're not actually doing anybody any favors. Like it's just, it's just going to be worse for everybody in the end. So um, put on your big boy pants and, you know, and, and make those hard decisions, but do it in an empathetic way. Right. So it sounds like if I'm hearing you both correctly, uh, there seems to be a lot of focus in terms of what you guys are talking about as far as development, mentoring, training of employees. And then Kat, to your point, the great managers will also tie back the work that a direct report is doing to maybe the overall business objectives and why their work matters. And in, in terms of like the you, you know, one of the things that we hear about a lot in the games industry and w- varying by different game studios is the actual, in terms of the work itself, in, in terms of like the observation of the work or evaluating the performance of the work, how, what would you say in terms of that part, you know, for studios that crunch a lot, is a great manager someone who can like force their employees to get a lot of performance or maybe that's the wrong way of ter- of, of stating that or like, what should the role of a manager be in terms of the actual evaluation, observation, or output of the work that direct reports do? Um, shall I jump in? No, <laughs> yeah, um, please. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think that you, you and Kat kind of touched on this already. You, you've got that ro- two roles to play, right? You're there yeah. as you're, you're there for the company that you work for to make sure that the people there are, are doing their best work and hopefully leveling up as well. So you, you, you do have to kind of keep both of those things in mind. A, a common mistake, I think, for new new managers is they want to 
purely focus on the people and that's always coming from you know a great place and they want to you know do everything right by those people but sometimes that's not actually setting them up for success if they're kind of allowing them not to do the role they're really there to do or they're not setting them up to do their best work in that role so yeah I think you as a manager I think you need to start from a position of trust you trust that the people that you're working with and that you've hired are going to do the things that they're there to do you're not kind of checking on them every five seconds to see if they're doing the thing they said they were going to do earlier and try and make any kind of targets or goals, depending on what it is they're doing, measurable. There's something tangible they're going to do that you can agree that that was a good result at the end of you know, a period of time. And then you should give the, you know, that individual the flexibility, hopefully, to get there in the way that makes sense for them. Um, you know, I, I think commonly you'll get new managers kind of come in and they kind of stamp down, okay, this is how you do the work and you know, I want you to do it the way that I've always done it. And that, that sometimes stifles people from achieving it in a different way. But, but you do need to, I guess, be objective enough to then kind of sort of be honest with yourself and with that person if that work was actually good enough or if, if you did hit what you set out to do over the course of the year, even if there's, you know, lots of, lots of reasons why it didn't come together or the quality wasn't quite there for reasons beyond control, it's good to be talking about that all the time and be really clear what's expected. I think people in the long term prefer that if you're getting if you're getting a kind of consistent and honest assessment of what you're doing rather than someone saying oh yeah everything's great everything's brilliant and then suddenly out of nowhere there's this course correction of no actually it wasn't very good people get really knocked back by that and it actually isn't helping them in the long term to kind of mask how things are going so i think that firm but fair kind of approach again that i mentioned earlier on just you know consistent be honest if you're giving feedback from a place of wanting to develop the individual, it's not going to be like punitive yeah. and horrible to them. You're you're trying to help them be successful in right. their role, but you do have that role to play, I think, to give them that feedback. Right. So if I'm hearing you correctly, James, it's basically like just working with the direct report to make sure that whatever the objective is in terms of the performance or output, that whatever that goal is, is agreed upon and is very clear. And then in terms of how they actually do the work, you don't want to micro exactly what they do or how they do it. But what you're looking for is just whatever that agreed upon output looks like. Is that? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I would agree with that. And you may need to help them get there. So if you set them a goal and they're struggling to hit that, then as a manager, you might need to then start to step in and give them some structure or some advice or some coaching or something to enable them to hit that goal. But if you start from a point of view, okay, here's your job and I want you to do this, 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 and this, like a checklist, that person's never going to really kind of grow. They're going to just wait for the next instruction. So I think it's, you know, it's that kind of thing. I'm talking obviously completely general here. I mean, you can get very specific for different crafts and there's different types of work in different parts of the games industry. But as a, as a general rule, I think you've got, to, you've got to start from that position of trust, give them the space to do their work and get to a goal, maybe in a way that surprises you. And then if they're struggling, you know, start to close that brief in, simplify it down and help them to get there and then step back again once they start to hit it. Kat, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, James, you, you hit the nail on the head that it has to come from a position of, of trust first, right? And when you're developing someone in a way that feels like, hey, I'm helping you get to where you want to go, right? Then, then you're much more open to receiving that feedback. So focus on you know what's the outcome rather than just like the work being done uh, and building that feeling that that you're on their side right and and that even when you're giving critical feedback or or you're saying you know what you're not in the right job how can you do that in a way that feels like I'm on your side in this conversation because this is just a mismatch and I think having now worked a lot in the UK and a lot in the US there's a real kind of cultural, um, layer to this. So like in the US in particular, our professional identity is so tied up with our personal identity and our sense of who we are, right? Like you go to a cocktail party, like when cocktail parties are a thing, right? And one of the first things that, that people ask you, right, is what do you do? In the UK, James, you can back me up on this or not, like it's kind of rude, right? Yeah, like it's it like, don't be, yeah. do my job. It's, it's definitely the two are, are separate from one another. You're not defined by your work, I think, is, is fair for most people. Uh, you know, it, it varies. Not all industries, but, <laughs> um, but like, you know, while, while we're talking in broad general terms, right? And, and when you're in a culture where your job 
and your sense of self are so closely tied together, um, feedback that says, hey, you're not good at your job, very rapidly and very frequently becomes translated into, you're a bad person, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is something wrong with your character, you know, your sort of sense of character because you don't know how to do this thing yet. And so I think, you know, as you think about leading with empathy, how do you separate those things out? Um, uh, there's a concept of S-curves in, in skill development. I don't know if you guys have come across that one, right? But you'll see it in like training courses. I think it's a McKinsey thing. And I find it really helpful to, when I'm uh, working with a team member, to say for this particular skill that we're working on, where is this person on that S-curve, right? Are they just learning how to do it? Um, where everything is kind of hard and slow? Are they on that rapid acceleration up where they're like really on fire figuring it out? Uh, or are they at the mastery part where they're actually not learning that much anymore? They're just really good at what they do. And quite frankly, they're probably going to get bored and you need to find another curve to, to move them up. And thinking through having different frameworks of how you develop somebody based on where they are on that curve for that specific thing that they're learning to do, to me, I find to be a very helpful um, framework, right? That's because a super you need, cool analogy. I really it just like back, back, back to your original question, right? The how much hand-holding you do, how much micromanaging you do really depends on how much you, not only how much you trust that person to be able to do the thing, but how confident they are in their ability to do the thing, let alone do they actually have the skill to be able to do the thing. Um, and and getting the match of all those things right, I think that's the secret sauce. Right. And maybe to just even dive a little bit deeper into the specific qualities or skills of a manager. And you guys have alluded to a few different things. James, you talked about authenticity. You talked about trust, you know, cat. I think one of the things that you touched upon is actually having some situational context, right? Understanding for this specific individual, maybe because we're in the UK, you might treat that individual in, in a different way from somebody in the US or things of that nature. But could we dive a little bit more into like, if you were to think about or to break down, what are some of the key skills or qualities that a great manager should be really cognizant of and start to try to develop to become that great manager what would you say some of those things are? Listen well. Okay. 100% listen well. 100% <laughs> agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think Kat earlier mentioned like leading with empathy, right? That is that empathetic yeah. skill, like being able to, to hear different people, hear what they're saying, understand where they're coming from. So I think coupled with that, it's like a a kind of an emotional maturity so it's nothing to do with age but but yeah. a, a degree of either experience or ability to kind of understand where someone's coming from where's this feedback like we were talking about the context in which someone's operating in what their background is what their preferred communication style is really starting to think okay where's this coming from what's this person thinking when they're saying this and sometimes even just taking the time to just hear people out. Sometimes, you know, people that work in your team, they need to decompress. There isn't actually a point. They just need to sit down with you for half an hour and just go, oh my God, this is just too much, or this is really bugging me, or I need to get this off my chest. And once that process has happened, then you can actually help them get the side. So yeah, listening skills. If you're not a good listener, um, it's it, I've, I've come up with some managers who aren't good listeners. They hear the bits that they're, they're interested in and so on, and often you have to help them go, you know, well, have you actually sat down and asked this person or is that actually what they're saying? Or, you know, what do they really think about that? And then they start to kind of connect a bit more with their, their team member. Right. Yeah, 100%. So for managers who want to build some of those skills, whether it's listening well or leading with empathy, what would you recommend that they do? So maybe it's in terms of like during one-on-one -on -one meetings that they spend some time at the beginning, just trying to talk to their direct report about issues and try to listen to them or what 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 are specific things i would that you could think of to try to to get people to start to practice some of these skills um i, th I think in a one-to-one -one context you obviously you've got to give enough space there's there's yeah. some basic techniques you can learn in terms of asking open questions okay. not sort of bombarding people with information or, or statements but right. 
you know, starting with very open, you know, how are you today and what's going on and how do you feel about this and seeing where that goes. I think a very, I mean, a very basic one for a brand new manager is just spending some time with people. So, you know, when I first started at King, I, I interviewed every single one of the team, got to know their backstory, spent an hour with right. them, you know, no agenda, no, here's, here's the objectives we're going to go through. Just learn about who they are as people and what, what are they motivated by and where are they going? I think then, you know, in a one-to-one -one capacity, yes, there's some, some basics you can do in terms of learning, you know, how to leave space in an interview, be be present in that interview as well. Don't turn up when you're kind of checking on your phone and half <laughs> listening to the conversation because you're not taking right. in their body language. You're not really absorbing what they're telling you. So right. in that moment, you've got to be, you know, devices down, focused on that one person and, and make sure that you're hearing what they're saying. And then I, I think another one um, that I commonly advise for, managers is, is a kind of a little and often approach in terms of one-to-ones so you know it scales depending on the size of your team but maybe like a weekly catch-up for half an hour is probably better than one big catch-up every month because things can go quite awry in, in the course of a month say and, and then you're kind of reacting to okay now I've got your time here's all these problems that have bubbled up as opposed to as, the, as they start to happen you can kind of just course correct more gently if you're catching up more regularly with people um, that's very general advice again obviously it's contextual depending on the work and the people but those those are the kind of areas I think that gives you a kind of base level connection I think with the people you're working with right Kat do you yeah, have I would, oh go ahead yeah I would, I would certainly agree with that and I, and I think James you touched on this earlier as well that one of the things that new managers uh, often do is sort of blur that line between being being friendly and being friends um, where you're kind of now become <laughs> like your therapist, right? Of let's just sit and chat through all the stuff you're feeling, which is all well and good and important, but you actually need to run the business uh, and being clear on what the decisions are that need to be made and, and making those decisions. Um, I've seen many new managers and experienced managers uh, stumble. And um, I certainly have made that mistake in the past and probably will make it again, right, of delaying making a hard decision uh, because of the impact that it will have on the team. And it's it's really one of your main responsibilities, right, be able to make hard decisions and, and um, being able to articulate what is the decision that needs to be made. Um, another just sort of super tactical thing that I like to do is uh, Absolutely have frequent one-to-ones, but often I find that the uh, weekly one-to-ones, they get taken up with kind of operational stuff, right? Mm -hmm. What's going on with this piece of work? What's going on with that goal, right? What's the stuff that's happening day to day? And so breaking out um, right about once a quarter and having a separate uh, personal development one-to-one -one that's really around where are you going? What are you working on kind of from a personal skills perspective? Uh, and let's not talk about what's going on day to day in the business at all. Because I find if you try to, you know, annual performance reviews, like they're good, they provide value, but a year is a really long time, right? How do you um, create opportunities for someone to develop in in much shorter time frames, uh, regardless of what kind of the official structures are of of your business? I think is important. Uh, so have the regular operational one-to-ones on a, on a very short cadence, uh, and then many times a year have one-to-ones that are really focused on career and personal development. Yeah, it's a really great shout. And also kind of maybe breaking out of the office or something, if that's possible, or, you know, obviously at the moment it's a virtual office or yeah, a different office. background in Zoom or something, but, um, you know, if you can take people out for a coffee or something like that, it changes the nature of that conversation a little bit as well, changes the atmosphere around. You can maybe open up a little bit about how that personal development piece is going. But yeah, it's, it's really good advice to make sure there's some time for that individual's development as well as just catching up on a project or something like that. Got it. And, you know, given that one of the things that you, you both have identified is a key kind of responsibility for managers in terms of skill development. And Kat, you're, you're mentioning like, you know, some initiatives around skill development. Could you guys talk a little bit more about, so what should, or how does that look for both of you in terms of 
how you evaluate the skill of one of your direct reports and what are potential, whether it's frameworks or methodologies that you would use to try and identify how somebody should be building skill over time? And then how do you kind of give that feedback? Are there, you know, whether it's like a, you know, um, just general feedback as far as like a Deloitte consulting start, stop, continue type of framework, or maybe it's like, do you have like a skills matrix or kind of specific definition of how people should be developing? Or maybe you guys could just you know, speak to me in terms of how do you guys generally think about that? Or are there frameworks, tools that you guys use to, to think about skills development? Uh, maybe starting with you, James. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a very, very broad topic, of course. <laughs> it depends. Firstly, I'd say it depends if I'm coaching somebody who's um, a direct report, who's doing a job and a job alone, or whether it's somebody who's like a team leader or a manager themselves. Obviously, that's a very different set of skills. I love Kat's um, analogy of the S-curves thing. That's such a, a good analogy for managers who kind of, they, they start off thinking they're ready to do a managerial job and then realize they have to learn all these other skills that they've never used before. These are totally different set of kind of communication and uh, you know, interpersonal skills they need to develop. I think, yeah, skills matrix type thing for somebody who's doing a you know individual contributor type role and needs to do very well. The more specific you can be on that, the better, in my opinion. Um, there's nothing worse than somebody who is feeling they're doing a good job and their manager is giving them sort of vague ideas about what they need to do to continue. And there doesn't seem to be anything specific that individual can do. I remember being told once at a, pre <laughs> a job a long time ago that I couldn't be promoted because there was somebody... Uh, older than me that they weren't ready to promote and they weren't ready to push me. so things like that just drive people nuts like when they just don't know what it is they need to do and if you can be it's really hard sometimes with soft skills particularly in the games industry you think of people like games designers maybe artists to some degree where it's a kind of a, it's good when I see it kind of feeling in, in the work it can be very difficult to quantify that but it's, it's something I've done a lot say with managing designers in the past is really drill into what those skills are that you need to exhibit. And even then, it's not like a checklist. It's not like do this, 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 and this, and you get a promotion at the end of the year. It's more like, this is the framework of skills I'm expecting to see you exhibit. Here's how you move from like a mid-level person to a senior to a principal or something. This is the influence area I'm expecting you to have. So, you know, to start off with, it's very local. Then I'm expecting to see you have an impact on your team, then outside your team in the wider area and help them try to, picture what that looks like if if, if you've identified find something together then really dive in on that and help them give them the training or find a mentor that can give them that it doesn't necessarily all need to come from you um, you know be genuinely on their side to try and help them get to that point um, it's it, going back to the little and often thing again it's you set up a framework like cats are you know checking in regularly on their development through the year giving them steer and advice and course correction, see how they're doing along that way. So you're not kind of getting to the end of the year and then going, yeah, no, I'm not really feeling it. I don't think you quite <laughs> hit the grade. I can't really explain why, but it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not really that happy with it. You've got to kind of really, you know, give some specific examples that you've noted down during the year. You know, this went really well. I loved how you gave that. Maybe next time you could try this or, you know, next time you do that presentation, let's try this approach and, you know, see if that works for you. And, you know, giving them feedback all the way through the year and also things that didn't work. You know, if there's an example of where something didn't go right, hopefully you're sitting down and going through that discussion. But you've taken note of that. And when you're looking back over the course of the year, you know, you remember this incident. OK, we worked through it, but, you know, we, we needed to make a, a you know a correction there. So so specific examples all the time to back up that that kind of skills matrix approach. I think if it's managers, it's a whole different, whole different thing again. We maybe we can go into that as well in a second. But uh, I thought yeah, maybe Kat, do you want to kind of come in on where I've started there? Yeah, I, I think um, the examples you pointed out are really good, right? Uh, talking specifically around uh, individual contributors, right? Examples, um, a framework if you've got one. I also think that peer feedback is invaluable, right? And and just focusing on building a culture where giving feedback is appreciated uh, and, and also expected. Um, and, and quite frankly, teaching people how to receive feedback, right? How to receive uh, unpleasant feedback. Uh, because if you are bad at receiving unpleasant feedback, you're not gonna get any, and then you're gonna be stuck where you are. Um, 
one thing I might also add uh, is that it's very common for, you know, you have a new employee or a new manager uh, and they come in and they say, hey, uh, I want to be promoted, right? And you get a lot of focus on, I basically just started this job. What do I have to do to get promoted? And that's one of the things that I find helpful is to try to like raise the, sort of extend the horizon a little bit and shift the conversation from what are the things I need to do to get promoted to what are the things that I want to develop for the long run? Like, where am I going? My goal is not to get promoted, right? My goal is to, you know, I want to be just expert at my craft, right? I want to run a Fortune 500 company. <laughs> like, where, where are you going? And how are you starting to think about your portfolio of skills? And promotions are nice, obviously, right? They're important sort of signifiers of, of progress, um, whatever that means. But quite frankly, like the more experienced you get, the longer it's going to take in between promotions. And you need to have, a, a, I would say, a healthier framing of why you are building this skill set, right? Mm -hmm. Why you are trying to achieve this. Is it about the money? Is it about the status? Is it about the recognition? Is it about like my sense of personal worth? And if you can understand that as a manager, then I think you could have a much more constructive conversation with that employee of, of not so much focusing on uh, what do I have to do to get to the promotion. Uh, and and just also, yes, managing managers, totally different yeah. kettle of fish. Um, you, you also um, kind of reminded me of an area that's quite common as people get more senior in whatever craft they do. The, the skills matrix type thing starts to kind of rapidly run out of room. Um, there's not really the kind of the more senior you get or the higher up in an organization you go, the less defined those roles are going to be. So sometimes it's helping people, maybe they've moved from a senior position to a, like a principal role or something like that, helping them define what that even is. You know, where do they add new value? What, what's changed about their role? Sometimes you're having to help them almost discover that for themselves a bit and helping them manage their way through a bit of ambiguity about where they now find themselves. And then, you know, we'll get on to manage, managing managers, I'm sure. But it's often that thing of kind of almost rediscovering themselves. It's not just do what you used to do, but a little bit more. Or you get paid more for doing the same job. You've now, you're now expected to do extra. You've got to have an impact right across your organization or you're expected to go outside and network with other people or you're meant to be developing those around you where you weren't before. It, it varies depending on the role, but helping people through that, I think, can be you know quite tough sometimes. It really takes um, that people kind of, sometimes they're at the top of the game in a particular role, they're super self-confident, they're really flying, and then they jump up into the next run and they suddenly kind of feel completely out of their depth. They don't know if they're doing a good job anymore, and the manager has to help them kind of steady themselves and, and refine themselves almost. So as much as a skills matrix helps you get to a certain point, there's also that, that very nebulous area when someone starts to get to a senior position where you have to just help them almost discover themselves again as a, as a new manager or as a, a leader or someone who's seen as a thought expert on a certain area, you know, you need to help them find that identity for themselves almost. Right. And maybe before jumping into a discussion about managing managers, Kat, I, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into one thing that you mentioned, which was around this topic, which in my experience has been one of the biggest issues, which is like giving and receiving direct feedback. Because if I'm being honest, most, I would say 90% of the places I've been, it actually doesn't happen, right? And especially the larger the organization and the more political the organization like actually giving direct feedback is a death sentence, <laughs> if, if I'm being honest. And so could you talk a little bit more about that, Kat, in terms of, how, you know, what does it, in your opinion, what what is your approach around giving and receiving direct feedback? And to your point about training people to receive direct feedback, what are some examples of things that people could do? So you're totally right. I am. Um, I have been through countless performance review cycles where you see the peer feedback come in and it's all glowing. You're like, I know that you have, think that this person, you know, has this challenge. Like you've complained to me about it all the time and yet you didn't write it down. 
<laughs> right? Uh, because people want to be supportive and they also don't want to um, right, like be punished essentially, right? For, uh, for giving that feedback. Um, so I find that there's something about the very formal performance review process that says, you know, this, this is feedback that will be on your permanent record, uh, which makes it big and scary and, and uh, kind of sets the bar high right. for what you're going to put in there. Right? It's going to be there forever. Um, and if you can build a culture of feedback just in like small interactions, it's much healthier and tends to happen more. Right. So, and, and, you can do it by uh, putting it in the context of what they're already doing, like not a shit sandwich, right? But saying like, presentation was really good. It would be even more effective if, right? Or, and, and all those sort of in the moment, um, thanks for sending that through. Uh, it would be a little clearer if you could tell me X um, or, pushing on uh oh and can you can you add that right like teaching people uh very sort of specific things that they can do to be more effective um in the moment right i mean we've all had the instance of feedback shows up six months later for a thing that you did before right that's not particularly useful um and 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 the tone comes from the top Right, so if you can demonstrate that you're giving that feedback uh, to uh, ideally to peers, but to team members in a way that is, um, what was this, semi-public, like in safe spaces, but giving feedback that is reinforcing and also constructive, um, I think that can be that can be quite effective. Like generally, obviously, you want to praise in public and, and criticize in, in private. But when you're giving, uh, I think there's also ways to do constructive feedback in public that does not feel like shaming, does not feel right. like you're in any way embarrassing the person, but more giving them more opportunity to grow into. And then in terms of how you would encourage other people to also be giving direct feedback, is there something specific that you do or basically leading by example? I think leading by example is is the big one um and it can get a little bit hokey but that you ask for it right you ask for it and then you act on it like you can incorporate that as part of of retros uh, right there's ways um to formalize but keep it informal right Th this is going to be a session where we're going to be talking about this sort of thing it's not going to be written down right this is not going to decide whether you are a four or a five, right? It's just so you know right. how people are receiving the work that you're doing. Okay. And then for, let's say a specific direct report, who's being very defensive as, as you give some feedback and it's like, whoa, but this and that makes, you know, is be, there are people who are like that. How would you deal with that situation? Or to your point about training someone to receive the feedback what, what would be your thinking or approach? I usually let it sit for a while. Okay. Right, because I think that often their first response is to go, oh no, let me explain why. And da -da -da -da, like, let me tell you why your feedback is wrong. Um, and then they go home and they think about it and they're a little bit cheapish and then they come back the next day and then you say, hey, you know, should we talk about that feedback again? <laughs> right? And usually it's a different conversation once they've had time to get their sort of fight or flight response out of the way. Okay. Uh, James, what have you found? I, we've um, w when I was first um, at King and I was managing a, a team of designers, we had we had this kind of issue where within the team, everybody's feedback to each other was very positive. It was always the good stuff. It was always well done. You're doing a great job, and we had to try and frame that from the point of view of like if we're going to get better as a team, we need to provide a way to give each other constructive feedback. And we worked with the, the training team there to provide um, some training in radical candor, which is this idea of, it's exactly what Kat's been saying. It's, it's uh, direct feedback, it's honest feedback, but it's constructive and it's friendly. It's not designed to tear someone down or, or belittle them. You're giving them 
um, honest appraisal of what they just did in order to help them get better. And that, that definitely helped the team um, sort of frame it in that way. Um, so you moved out of only giving people nice feedback where they're not really learning if they missed a trick and you actually help them maybe practice giving each other feedback on certain things or just doing it regularly, exactly as Kat says, in retrospectives or provide sessions to give each other feedback and practice it. And what I find generally with teams is, I think it's a very human, natural reaction to be defensive to someone criticising you. I don't think that's an unusual thing for someone to feel. But once you get over that hump, like as a like in your craft, you'll actually crave that feedback. Once you've had it and you've enjoyed it and you've seen yourself getting better from it, you'll just always be looking for that feedback after them. So it's um it's quite a you know it's a thing you have to sort of lead people onto. I think and a bit of practice, a bit of training, setting up the right environment, just as Kat says. And, you know, sometimes individuals need a little bit of a nudge, um, but mostly it's about kind of getting used to it. And if you can lead by example, yeah, doing things like um, like a 360 survey or something that your direct reports get to contribute in, that then signals to them that you are also looking to receive feedback and you're actually doing something about it. So if you say, if you can kind of summarize, okay, I just had this survey and I did these things, this is what I'm working on this year, that, that really does then set an example to everyone else of like, Okay. Yeah. Uh, even even my boss thinks that's a good idea, so I'll I'll give it a whirl as well and see see if it works for me this year. I think that's such a good idea, James. The it it shows so much um, vulnerability, right? To be able to say to your team, "Hey, this is what I this is what I got from the feedback. Uh, here's what I'm doing about it, and and keep me accountable, right? If you see me not doing it, give me the secret handshake, right? Yeah. And and remind me that I said I was going to be doing this." Yeah, I absolutely agree. And so sometimes it can be frustrating that you get feedback from members of your team and you're like, that's not me, that isn't true. But that, it kind of doesn't matter if the feedback's there, that's their perception, right, right or wrong, whatever's contributing to it. So showing them that you've heard that message and you're trying to do something about it um, speaks volumes. I think it, it shows that you, you're trying your best, you're trying to learn, you're also a human being who's <laughs> not perfect, who messes things up sometimes. But, um, you know, it, it sort of sets a precedent for them to try and do the same thing on, on their local level. Right. Okay, great. And maybe now talking to James, you've been alluding to this notion about managing managers and kind of like skills development for managers. Could you speak to some of your thinking along those lines? Yeah, it's, it's something I've, I've done a fair amount over the last kind of, I don't know, five or, or five or six years. And it's very different trying to lead people into that space. Um, as we've kind of been touching on like right the way through, it's, it's a quite an individual thing, your style or your brand as a manager. There's no kind of single way to be a manager, but all of these different soft skills in play. And, you know, you're trying to be your authentic self and also try and lead and be responsible and all of these things. So how you do that as an individual is very unique, I think. So you do need to kind of understand that person and help them. I think we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier on, but you've got to give them some space to develop as a, you know, as a leader and a manager, but do that in a safe way. So they've got to, they've got to be able to fail, but in a, in a safe environment. So if you're giving them some new responsibilities for people, it's no good to kind of leave them alone for six months and come back and there's like HR lawsuits and, <laughs> and like a disaster on the team or something like it's too late by then. You've got to, you've got to kind of, you know, help them along the road without doing it for them. And that's very diff difficult when you're managing managers. I think that there's a, a whole bunch of stuff that they, they commonly kind of um, miss or kind of uh, new people new to management often stumble into. So the, the, the number one thing I, I think I always see is, say someone who's been really good at doing an individual job and now they're going to be a manager as well, they still think they should be doing that entirety of that individual job and also doing managerial stuff. And what they end up doing is in their first few months, they completely burn themselves out because what they do is they, they do all the things they used to do and then they're trying to find all the time for one-to-ones and looking after their team and organising their team and they just completely get overwhelmed. So often you have to help them Firstly, understand that they can't do all the things they used to do, which is a, an uneasy feeling for people who've been very good at what they do. And often you're, it's, it's not like helping them to be even better at their craft or something. It's like really basic things like how to organize your note-taking system or how to manage your calendar or, 
you know, how to give yourself enough energy and recovery time during a day. Because often they haven't needed those skills up until that point. And then they step into this role and they're like, oh, this is way too much. And they're, they're struggling for reasons that are nothing to do with their individual skill. It's just they haven't got themselves kind of set up properly. So you have to do a lot of, a lot of that kind of thing. Um, I think we've touched on a few of the common pitfalls, like trying to be everyone's friend, be a buddy. I'm going to help you get to where you want to go. You know, I'm going to make it happen for you. Those kind of traps come along quite often. Sometimes you get someone who's been in a group of peers and then that one person steps up and suddenly it gets really weird for them. They're, the dynamic has changed and they're, they're sort of still friends, but also they're kind of their boss now and they've got to kind of relearn that. So just being there and supporting them through that. I think the, um, one of the best things you can do is mentally prepare them for this stuff as well. I think that um, the more um, upfront advice you can give them on, you know, what's coming as a manager and is setting them up for some of the types of conversation that are going to come their way that they might not have anticipated is, you know, you're really helping them. So a, a common thing is that um, new managers might be what, what might be motivating them to be a manager is that they love the idea of helping people out, helping them develop, you know, being involved in the craft that they work on. But maybe what they haven't mentally considered is that person's also going to come to you when they're having, you know, a crisis at home or when they are underperforming and you need to help them get out of that hole. So you, you kind of need to prepare them mentally that they'll also have to have hard discussions as well as the nice stuff. And, you know, you do it well and you do it right. It's a super, super rewarding role, but it's not an easy job. There's a reason why only so many people are good at it. There's a reason it's paid more. There's a reason why it's not for everybody. Um, it's quite tough to do to be a manager. So if you can kind of set them up with that in mind, they normally get there eventually. Um, yeah, giving them giving them plenty of space, identifying what their skill gaps are with them um, early on. So, you know, we touched on these skills like communication skills and listening and empathy and those kind of things. Some people just, they just take to it. It's the most natural thing in the world to them. They're already kind of doing it. They, they don't even realize they've got a superpower. Some people, it's a massive, you know, gulf for them to overcome and it takes them a year or something of practicing being a human and relating to people and listening and developing those skills and then then it clicks and they and following cat's s curve and analogy suddenly they just take off as a manager and all the rest kind of comes with them so um you know i think those those are a bunch of basics a kind of catch-all for everybody and then we can probably get into some more specifics but Kat, which ones have I missed? There's probably heaps that I've, I've not touched on yet. I mean, you, I think you, you touched on a lot of the really good ones. Um, one thing I might add is when you are managing managers, your relationship with their direct reports changes a bit as well, right? Especially if you're in a growing company where you knew, you knew the sort of individual contributors quite well, they know you, now there's a manager in the midst they keep trying to come to you, you know, making sure that you're really setting, uh, I would say boundaries, right. Of no, this is, we can still, um, you know, be friendly and I'll have a relationship with you, but you need to actually channel these things back through them, through the manager, right. Of making sure that you're, um, setting the manager up to, to be successful and not, not, um, undermining them accidentally. Um, the, the other thing I think, um, going back maybe more on the leadership side than the management side, is giving the manager uh, clear guidelines on what success goods looks on mm -hmm. what success looks like, right? What are the outcomes they are responsible for? What are the constraints that they have and what are the resources that they have available? And then let them know the shape of their box um, and then let them figure it out, right? You don't, if you're figuring it out for them, then you're not actually helping, right? Then you've just added kind of a middle management layer that doesn't do anything other than maybe do the one-to-ones, right? Like you need to actually give them a scope of, a meaningful scope of, of work, scope of business that they're responsible for and where they can make important, significant decisions that impact uh, you know, their, their piece of the pie. That's a really good one. Yeah, something I used to try to do to get people used to hiring, for example, being a hiring manager, was 
delegate the role of like graduate hiring for a year to to new managers right so they they get to go through all the steps you you ultimately are responsible for the, per, the person that comes in but you you've stepped them through every step of that process from start to end so then when they see people come in they they know that that person was someone they hired they went through all of the processes to get there and they've got a kind of I don't know, a structure, I suppose, a, a technique of how to do this in the future. They had, they, they absolutely had responsibility for it, but it, in terms of the grand scheme of things for the company, if that was a mishire or if they didn't find a good fit, it's not going to destroy the business overnight. So they, they've had the, the ability to kind of feel their way into that. They've had a lot of trust and responsibility put into them. You're there in the background, but what you're not doing is kind of going, oh, no, no, you don't want to do that. Let me do this one for you. And then you've kind of taken that agency away from them. And those kind of things are really great for new managers. If you can find them a thing to own that's safe enough that it's not going to you know, be a catastrophe if it, does, if it goes wrong, but there's enough responsibility where they get that kind of the, the little kind of the white heat down the back of the spine of like, oh my God, like this is me. Like I'm in charge of this thing now. That's, yeah, if you can find that spot for them, it really helps them develop. So yeah, like creating that box as you define Kat and sort of letting them step into that and feel their way into it a bit, be patient. It'll probably kind of go a bit wrong for a few weeks. They'll be a bit panicky and then they'll sort of ease their way into it after a while. That's a, that's a good place to be with them. Right. Uh, I thought we can next talk about, so Google conducted the study in 2008 called Project Oxygen. And basically what they did is they studied the behaviors of Google's best managers based upon an employee survey. And they did an update in 2018, so a couple of years back. And they came up with these kind of 10 oxygen behaviors. And I wanted to get your reactions to what you guys thought about some of the stuff that that were the findings from Project Oxygen. So these 10 behaviors according to Oxygen were one, is a good coach. Second, empowers team and does not micromanage. Third, creates an inclusive team environment showing concern for success and well-being. Four, is productive and results oriented. Five, is a good communicator, listens and shares information. Six, supports career development and discusses performance. Seven, has a clear vision strategy for the team. Eight, has key technical skills to help advise the team. Nine, collaborates across Google. Ten, is a strong decision maker. Now, certainly some of these things, it you know, you guys have also touched upon, but in terms of the context of those 10 behaviors, just wanted to get your general feedback or thoughts in terms of, is it, do you generally agree? Are there things that you would disagree with or, you know, and, and how kind of actionable do you think this is? And, and maybe starting with you, Kat. <laughs> I think I think it's a great list. There's nothing okay. in there that I would I would disagree with. I think okay. maybe one that's worth um, just poking at a little bit is the technical skills to advise the team. Mm -hmm. I think is actually just great phrasing, um, because it's particularly for new managers. And, and James, you talked about this a little bit, right? You're you need to step out of the doing the work um, and help others to do the work. Uh, and that's a really hard transition, right? And, and often uh, make you feel sort of like, well, what am I, what am I actually doing here? What value am I adding? Um, uh, but it's an important step. So I'm, I'm, which is just to say, I think it's good that that's in there, uh, and that I like the way that it's phrased. <laughs> and I think the rest of the list, I, I take no issue with any of them. I think they're all important. Yeah, I, I, I picked out that one in the list as well. Like, there's a temptation, I think, for some new managers where they feel like they need to demonstrate that they're the best at a certain craft like to be the manager they need to know more than all of their line reports otherwise how would that person like believe them or trust them and it, it stops being true actually uh, if, uh, particularly in things like the engineering craft but you can apply it to anyone the best managers are often not say the best engineers they're the best people for managing engineers if you see what i mean so yeah. they enable people who are subject matter experts to be awesome at what they do um, so yeah, helping them on that is quite good. So that is really well phrased. Um, I picked out as well as like has a clear vision or strategy for the team. I think often Cat uh, pointed this one out right at the start. It's kind of helping people find their place in the organisation or what their role means for the future, and helping them through that ambiguity. So sometimes you can find a team is like they're not that excited about the current mission or. The thing that they thought they were going to do they're not getting to do now so now what you know what do we do as a team what's exciting for us 
how do we find something that we do want to do? Uh, you can add huge value there, both for the company and also for the individuals. It helps them settle and maybe find a way to develop their careers um, in a way that they hadn't anticipated. Um, and we, we've touched on some of the others already. Um, I think the one on empowers team and uh, sorry, the um, creates an inclusive team environment. That one's subtly more difficult than it sounds. Actually, I think that um, if you've got a large team and you think of things like team meeting dynamics or presentations or something like that, you've got to be mindful. I think of a manager of not just kind of reacting to the the big personalities or the ones that dominate the conversation or whatever. You've got to find a way for those people who are perhaps slightly less confident or quieter in their demeanor or communicate in a slower way. They've also got to find a way to contribute. You need to make sure they can develop too. So creating an inclusive environment means all sorts of things, but it means making sure that everybody in your team feels like they can come in and do their best work, that they you know, have their opportunity to develop and contribute and so on. And Often as a manager, you have to step in and help there a little bit. It's not, you can't just sort of sit back and wait for it to happen. You often have to either create the space for an individual or challenge perhaps behaviors where one individual is dominating or one individual is saying something that's perhaps not the most inclusive for the group. You need to maybe just gently push in on that without making a massive deal out of it, just to make sure that the others can flourish within the group. And maybe just recognizing the overall makeup of skills within your team. So if you know, there's certain people on your team will contribute in different ways. Make sure they're having an opportunity to show what they can do in, in that area. Rotate around the responsibility for show and tells or who's taking point on organising the social this month or you know, whatever it is, but give everyone a go. You know, don't end up with your, you know, your stars that you invest 80% of your effort in and everyone else is kind of left on the periphery. You've got to kind of be, be fair to everyone in the group. So, yeah. Creating an inclusive environment, I find in games sometimes that's harder than it sounds. I think, particularly if I if I look back earlier in my career when we've got teams of white guys all of a similar age and background, all in an office with you know a particular type of banter and communication style, that's not going to be super inclusive for somebody new coming into the team, right? And you've got to think really carefully about that. Make sure that your team is. Uh, welcoming to everybody that people who communicate differently have got a chance to contribute and, and all of that stuff so yeah I think that one sounds like a yeah well of course you should do that as a manager and then when you start digging on that it's like well there's a lot of work in there actually that's something you have to really think about one um tactical thing on on that point when I've got new teams that are putting together I'm a big fan of using some of these sort of psychometric um, exercises, right. Whether it's disc or predictive index, or, I mean, you can use the like Adobe, my creative type, like it doesn't really matter so much which one you use, I think. I mean, they have different uh, strengths and weaknesses, but just having the team do it to realize, Oh, we look at problems a different way, right? We look at the world a different way. We like to communicate in a different way. Uh, and the value is, I mean, it's nice to kind of get a picture of, this is what you're like, uh, but it's more valuable when you start saying, well, what does that mean for the team, right? And and if it turns out that we're all, I don't know, red or owls or captains, or like whatever the, the framework is, and you've got one person over here who's a, whatever the other things are, uh, A, that person's gonna be really lonely and uh, feel like an outsider, and also you're missing so much in how you're making decisions, right? And so you have to work a little bit harder to think about, okay, well, what would be the, you know, if both trying to fill out your team, so you have those other uh, traits and characteristics in, on your team, but if you don't, uh, how do you simulate it, right? How do you just become aware that that's a gap in your team's makeup and you're going to have problems in making decisions if everybody's looking at a thing the same way. Um, and so I've, I find across the board, once people get past the, oh, that's hokey, I don't believe in personality tests stuff, uh, it ends up being a really fun and interesting conversation, whether or not uh, everybody feels perfectly represented by whatever their result is. That's kind of less the point than the sort of recognition that people look at the world in different ways, like to communicate in different ways. Uh, and as a leader and as a team member, you have to uh, you know, think about that, right? Back to our 
empathy. Okay. Yeah, going, going back to the feedback giving that we touched on earlier on, um, I had a had a team once, and we had two two people working together, and their skills were brilliant complements for one another, but communication wise they drove each other crazy to work alongside each other they were driving each other up the wall I was having one-to-ones with both of them and they were both like oh this is you know really really you know, doing my head in and we, we did um, the disc based training with them to and it helped them understand how each other communicated a bit and once they started down that road it worked okay so this is someone who prefers if I communicate in this way I will take that approach when I need to do it it just kind of it was just enough it just got them over the hump of like this is frustrating for us. And they started to collaborate. And then, you know, the complementary skills thing really started to come through. So, yeah, that, that's a really good thought there. And I know some teams kind of really go for it with things like those personality tests. They really kind of, they profile like everybody on the way in and see where everyone maps. I think I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I think you need to use it as a tool to crack a problem rather than a, a systematic approach. But yes, I, I think those can be great for helping people understand maybe why something isn't clicking so far. Yeah, don't use it as hiring criteria. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of like a next topic to, to talk about, I wanted to go back in terms of uh, an issue that you brought up, James, as far as trust and then the other issue around performance. And so if we're, if we're talking about managing a direct report and, you know, let's say you set a, a goal and so let's say we have a scenario where the direct report isn't quite hitting their goals over a period of time, then how should the manager react or what should the manager do in terms of trying to correct the, the issue? And, and may, maybe the person just doesn't have the skill yet or is way too far away in terms of like the S-curve or like, what, what do you do then when the goals that you are agreeing upon just aren't getting there or that person is not able to fulfill the specific task to achieve business objectives, for example. Yeah, it's, it's the, the toughest bit of managing, I think. It's one that I needed a lot of help with, actually. I, I had um, some mentoring from a, from a chap called Mike Ryder, who used to work for Blizzard and was working at Activision, and helped me particularly sort of reframe my thinking of this. I think my starting point as a manager was, I, I see potential in everybody, right? So it's it was always a case of this person will get there eventually. Like it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of hard work. And he helped me kind of rethink it from the perspective of both for you and for the individual. Like there's a, a kind of a, it, you kind of got to be fair to them and to, to all the others in your team. If you're, if, if that person isn't gelling with the role, they haven't quite got the skills to succeed in that role keeping them in that place of kind of perpetually not succeeding is actually quite unfair to them. And what you might find is that somebody who leaves and then, you know, joins in a new company or a similar position, but with a slightly different context, suddenly they flourish. Like it's just, they needed that kind of that reset point. So I think that's really important for managers to think through, like in terms of the performance thing, it's not being punitive or cruel, or at least I hope it isn't. Like hopefully they're coming from a place of wanting that person to succeed. Obviously you need to also be um, fair to the to the business and to the rest of the team that are being supported, right? So propping somebody up if they're not going to make it in the long term or they're not quite able to do the role, um, it's not fair on everyone else in the long term. Um, making exceptions or, you know, trying to cover for somebody if, if they're really struggling in that role, it may not be the fairest thing. So I think it comes back to the, the um, regular development conversations that Kat mentioned earlier. Like, it shouldn't be a shock. You shouldn't get to the end of the year and go, actually, you're miles short of the thing and we're going to think about letting you go. It's something you build up to gradually. So you've tried it from several angles. You've provided all the training and coaching you reasonably could. If they're not stepping into the role or they're not doing key parts of the role that you think they should be doing, then you kind of you can start to formalize it a bit more. It shouldn't be hopefully a conversation that suddenly escalates to firing somebody, but you could be maybe moving them into a more sort of serious period where you're actually evaluating their performance, um, you know, against a, a particular set of criteria. You're formalizing that over a period of time, you're going to be evaluating them. And if not, then you start to maybe talk about them moving on or are you going to fire that individual or something like that. 
Um, it depends massively, I think, what the problem is. If it's an individual technical skill, it would be disappointing if that's the reason that they, they ended up exiting the business. Obviously, if it's somebody's like personality or they are you know, really upsetting people around them or they're having a material impact on a live business or something, it might be more serious and it might escalate more quickly. Um, so context is really important there, I think. But um, I think that's the general approach I would take. Um, and trying to, you know, trying to keep bringing it back to measurable, objective-based things where you possibly can. The, these things can be incredibly tough. Like I've been through it a few times, um, particularly with designers um, and underperformance. And, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a horrible experience as a, as a manager. You, you don't want to mess people around. You don't like changing people's lives and resetting their career expectations and stuff. But sometimes it can be the best thing for them in the long term. Um, I've had some individuals who've left and then they've reached out to me later and you know they've actually said that they, in hindsight, they realized what they needed to do, but at the time it wasn't clear to them. So, you know, but also some people will leave and they may never speak to you again. You know, that's possible too. So you've got to be prepared to do that, I think, in the in the long term and just and you know, hope that you've made the right decision, hope that you've been fair in that consideration and judgment on their behalf and you know, if they've not performed, hopefully what will happen is if they leave and end up moving on, they will find their place somewhere else. They'll find a niche that is right for them and they'll flourish. And the rest of the team has got an ability now to kind of recalibrate and, you know, maybe see an opportunity themselves within the team now that person's moved on. Yeah. Yes, uh, I agree with all of that. Yeah, I, I think that sort of will and skill framework is a really good one. Um, uh, figuring out did this does the person not understand uh what we need them to do do they not know how to do the thing we need them to do uh or do they not want to do the thing you need them to do and and the path is going to be different based on um which of those things you're, you're going down and, and you know going back to this sense of uh professional identity and, and personal identity almost Never in my career have I come across somebody who we hired and then it turns out that they just didn't care, right? They didn't want to be there. They didn't care. Almost always it's a mismatch because we hired them into the wrong job. We gave them expectations that were unreasonable. We gave them expectations that were unclear, right? So if somebody's underperforming, it's not just about them. Right, it's about what is your responsibility as it relates to the position that person's in, and and sometimes, as James said, like the better outcome is for them to be somewhere else. And it doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It doesn't mean that they're a failure. It just means they were in the wrong place, right? And um, and that can be the better the better outcome in the long run, even though uh, it obviously sucks in the moment. It um, mm -hmm. sucks mostly for them, but also <laughs> sucks, you know, for for you. Um, but as a leader, as a manager, that's where uh, you need to take those hard choices. The other thing I'd think about though is that people aren't machines. They they're kind of they're they're fallible. They have ups and downs. They have unexpected things going on at home. So someone who's been a, a stellar performer for years can suddenly have a dip. Someone's motivation drops away after having a great start. Um, as we mentioned earlier, sometimes people struggle when they make a step up they were a superstar up until a point and then they find a level where they struggle at so i think you have to bear that in mind as well when it comes to performance can you understand the reason why you know what's going on what is it you can reasonably do and i think then i think what i would previously have done would be i would just tirelessly try and fix that problem but maybe to my detriment or maybe to the detriment of other members of my team where i'm biasing so much time towards someone who isn't going to quite make it you know they're good but not excellent or they're they're okay but they can't quite do a key aspect of the job how much of your time are you going to dedicate on them versus somebody who actually is doing quite a good job and could be amazing at their job but you're not giving them the personal development time because you're focusing on trying to fix a situation that maybe isn't fixable or an individual who's just you know they're not in the right context at the moment so that's something that kind of needs so you need to be kind of bringing yourself out of it all the time and kind of thinking about, okay, what's what's the big picture here? Is this a big problem? Is this a temporary thing? Is this ever going to get better than it is right now? 
Um, that's a tough judgment to make as well as a manager, I think. Yeah, maybe in terms of a next question, just kind of looking back over your careers or as, as you've observed new managers, what are some of the biggest mistakes or things that managers should be looking to avoid? I feel like we've um, talked about a lot of them. Okay. Uh, I don't know that I necessarily have any anything to add on that one, actually. Okay. No, I think yeah, I think we've we've covered a lot of them. I mean, the main one, as I say, that I see time and time again is that that problem when somebody steps up into a a, a more managerial role and they try to do their old job plus being a manager, so they right. end up trying to do one hundred and fifty percent of the job and. They start brilliantly, they love the work, and then you start to see the fatigue set in, they start burning out, they get stressed. Okay. They're helping them through that. Um, this kind of, th that fixed mindset thing that we touched on earlier on, like yeah. kind of force a particular, this is how you do your job. You know, that, that, that's quite difficult sometimes for people when they've been very good at what they do to then lead someone else to do that and accept that they might have a different approach or a different style, you know, that still gets to the same result, but isn't the same. Or maybe they're really, really awesome at what they do and they're managing someone who isn't quite as good and helping them kind of make peace with that and, and understand how to coach that individual to be better. That can be tough. Yeah, I, I think we've we've touched on them on okay. most of them. I, so, I think that really oh. for managers, it's just it's helping them understand that they need to develop new skills. They're not going to be able to just right. do what they need to do. They have to learn all these new skills we've been talking about yeah. and practice and develop those and often those skills are not kind of documented very well or they're not very clear to people yeah. until they're in the role. And so helping them through that's a, a big mission. Yeah. And by the way, so, you know, thank you so much for, you know, for this great discussion. I know we're running a little bit long. So maybe the last question I can ask is actually a point that you raised, Kat, at the beginning of our conversation was around this concept of the difference between a manager and a leader and Kat, maybe could you start in terms of when you think about what makes a great manager and what are some of the things that a manager or that a leader should be doing that a manager shouldn't be doing? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, maybe, Kat? I mean, I, I think the best do both. Okay. Um, the, the way that I think about it is that the leadership is more the big picture stuff. Right. Where are you going? It's the storytelling. It's setting a vision and a strategy and making sure that there's alignment across the organization, that everybody understands here's where we're going and that this is more important than that. Right. Like we're focusing on this. Okay. Don't focus so much on that. Um, management to me is more the kind of the day to day. Right. Like what are people doing? What's the path that they're on? Do they know what good looks like? Uh, all of the, the kind of smaller scale stuff. Okay. Um, and they're both, they're both super critical, right? Like you can't have one without the other. You don't have to have every individual be good at both of them, uh, but you have to have them both. James? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I can add much more really. I think that um, it's possible for someone to be an inspirational kind of figurehead who's actually quite rubbish at the people skills. And it's possible for a manager to maybe be a kind of mid-level manager who's not a big personality who stands out um, and still adds a lot of value. But I think by and large, you can't really escape one side. You know, the, the two can't be completely pulled apart from each other, or there'll be limits to the impact that that person can have if they don't have a bit of both. I think in a managerial role, you have to represent the business. You have to front up and maybe you know, represent something which is a tough message or something that you in your heart of hearts maybe wouldn't have wanted to do, but it's the right thing to do for the wider organization or you have to buy into a message. So there's, there's those kind of things that you have to do and that that's leadership skills rather than people management skills, but you need them as a manager, I think. So yeah, I, I agree with Kat. You can't really divorce one from the other. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, guys. If you have one last message or if there's a way for people to get in touch with you, how would they be able to do that? Maybe starting with you, Kat? One last message. The art of being a good manager, like it is worth it, right? It's, Absolutely. I think a lot of people worry when they transition from the IC role to being a manager role. And, and I think the impact that you have uh, on the people you manage and the people in your environment is just, is tremendous. So it's worth trying. 
and uh, reach me at uh, I'm Katerina Mele at Twitter is probably the best. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think my closing thought would be very similar. Um, I, I found being a manager super rewarding. I, earlier on in my career, I wanted to be like a lead designer and that sort of thing, but I've kind of gone through that phase and I actually find it much more rewarding now to see people go on and do something awesome. There's lots of people I've trained that have become leads and directors and they've had great careers around the world. And that for me is actually more rewarding than the kind of being interviewed about a game launch or something like that now. I, I much prefer that side of things. So if, if it's your calling, um, you know, if you like working with people, I would encourage people to to try get yourself a mentor if you haven't got a you know a direct report a direct manager who can help you with that stuff um, and try it out on a, a limited capacity um, but go into it understanding it, it, there's there's a tough side to being a manager as well um, but but when it comes together and you see people flourishing in their careers and stuff there's there's for me there's no more rewarding thing you can do like especially like within games i've seen <laughs> some or like people have just gone off and done amazing things and you're like awesome i'm glad that i was kind of there when they were just starting out or i i gave them their first right. gig as a manager or i helped them through that thing that could have been quite quite a problem for them <laughs> later on or something and it's it's lovely when you meet up with people later on and they you know they they're flourishing and you can see them going through stuff that you used to go through and so it's super rewarding so yeah if it's your calling stick with it get yourself a good mentor and uh you know hopefully you'll you'll get those kind of payoffs later on of seeing people doing awesome things in the industry all right great well thank you again very much there you have it how to be a great manager from two <laughs> great managers all right thanks so much and yeah we'll catch you next time thanks, thanks very much thanks i really thank enjoyed you. it